In this video, I want to talk about how we actually go about estimating weighted least squares models in practice, and the sort of name that this goes by in the literature is feasible generalized least squares. And the sort of F for feasible means that we can actually feasibly do this. Okay, so the example which we talked about a few videos ago was where we had sort of a bivariate relationship between yi and xi that was sort of positive, namely as xi tended to increase, yi tended to increase as well. And furthermore, we can sort of see that the distribution of the points away from the line was increasing as our independent variable increased. And we spoke about how we could actually use an explicit form of the variance if we knew it, which was equal to sigma squared times xi. And we used this particular variance in order to generate weights, which we then used to transform our model to a system whereby we could then use OLS on that transform system and we would have homoscedastic errors. In most cases, we don't actually know this explicit form of the variance. So we actually have to go ahead and estimate the functional form of the variance. And in order to do that, we need to first of all specify a model for our variance. So the sort of model which we specify is that the variance of ui given xi is equal to sigma squared times the exponent of a sort of linear combination of all of our independent variables. Because now we're sort of talking about the case whereby we can have more than one right-hand side independent variable. So we've got a sort of delta 1 times x1i all the way up to delta p times xpi. So why have we used a different form of the variance to that which we sort of specified initially? Because here this sort of top model is a linear model, whereas the bottom one, because it's got the exponent in it, is actually an exponent model, or an exponential model rather. Well, it's actually because of the fact that the variance can never be negative. And if we do just have a linear combination of xi on the right hand side as we do here, there's nothing to stop our variance from being negative if xi is negative in this top example. Whereas in the bottom example here, there is no way that the variance can ever be negative because the exponent of any number is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is the model which we're actually going to use for this situation, this sort of second model which we specified here. And how do we actually go ahead and estimate the particular form of the variance? So what's the sort of estimation strategy? Well, the first thing that we need to do is that we run a regression of our independent, or dependent variable rather, on our various independent variables. So we sort of have on the right hand side alpha plus beta 1 times x1i, all the way through to, in principle, up to beta p times xpi. And then we get the fitted values of our parameters on the right hand side, and as well we get our sort of fitted error, which we call our residual. So that's the first step. The second step is to then run a regression of the log of the sort of estimated errors, but it's not just the log of the estimated errors, it's the log of the estimated errors squared, and we run a regression of that on the various x variables. So that's sort of delta naught plus delta one times x1i, all the way through to delta p times xpi. So why have we used ui squared rather than just ui? Well, it's because of the fact that the variance of our error given xi is equal to the expectation of our error all squared given xi minus the expectation of ui given xi. And this second term here is sort of all squared. You can't quite fit it in there, but this whole sort of second term is squared. But we know that this sort of second term here is zero under the assumption of the zero conditional mean of errors assumption. So that's why our sort of variance is given kind of by at least the expectation of sort of ui squared. So that explains why we've got ui squared in this second re regression here. But why have we taken the log? Well, it's actually because this kind of makes it exactly analogous with this model which we've chosen up here because the sort of opposite of taking the exponent is taking the log of the left hand side and when we take the log of both sides of our model we actually get something which we specified here in two so that's that's why we take the log of this model so the next step is that we actually use our fitted values of the sort of coefficients on the right hand side so we generate something which we call gi hat or at least that's what waldridge calls it 
And then we have sort of delta naught hat plus delta one hat times x one i plus all the way through to sort of delta p hat times x p i. So that gives us our fitted values from the second regression. And in the next video, we're going to talk about how we use those fitted values in order to transform our model into a situation whereby we can do OLS on the transform system and we would have removed at least a degree of this heteroscedasticity. I'll see you then.